We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Uh, thanks for your patience. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just as a reminder, this uh, session is being recorded. And uh, when we're done, I'll post the recording in the announcements. Uh, it'll take me a day or so because uh, I have to send the recording out for captioning. And once that is uh, completed, then I will post the captioned uh, video in the announcements. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So you see the uh, course homepage um, that I'm sharing. Uh, somebody let me know. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I have yet to finish scoring your midterm exams. I, I hope to get that done. I can't, I can't hear uh, somebody's got an open mic. Um, so pl please, if you don't mind muting yourself. Um, but I, I do hope to, as I was saying, I do hope to get your exam scored here uh, later tonight. Uh, I do apologize. I've just been uh, a little bit uh, overwhelmed with the, the, the grading. So thanks for your patience on that. But I'll be getting that done tonight. And then if you have any specific questions after I'm done, you can reach out to me. All right, so um, yeah, I don't think uh, there's anything that I posted in the announcements recently that is um, anything I need to cover, but ah, that's what I was thinking about trying to remember. Um, if you look at this week's overview, week nine, I mean, if you look at the weekly overviews, notice that you have the project article approval deadline, right? Remember, there's a course project that you have to complete for this class. And if you're in lab class, you have to do two separate ones, meaning you have to get two articles approved, right? So in order to get your article or articles approved, it tells you here that you need to send me the full article as a PDF file, right? You attach it to an email and send it to me and I'll take a look at it and let you know whether it is acceptable. And when you click on that assignment in the weekly overview, there's a link to the project as well. You can get to the project. If you need to go and refresh yourself on the project and um, you know the various uh, details that you need to be mindful of, which I did cover, right? I did cover the fact that you're looking for uh, an article related to one of these five categories. 
Um, it has to be a peer reviewed article. I gave you three options for finding the article. And I remind you that the article has to be 15 pages long, not counting the references, meaning the references have to start on page 16 or the article is too short. Okay, so you send me, send me that article, I'll take a look at it and I will tell you um, if you, know, you can use that, that article. And you have until this Saturday to get that approved or there is a penalty that is discussed um, in the in the details just below the, this you know paragraph tells you what the penalty is if you don't get an article approved. Um, so if you hadn't done that already, um, you're running out of time, right? This weekend is uh, you know that's the cutoff. So um, don't um, you know. Don't put yourself in that situation. Go ahead and send me your article so I can uh, prove it. And then starting next week, uh, in next Monday night's class, I will start talking about the actual summary that you have to write so that you, those of you who have an approved article can be reading and preparing to write the actual summary, okay? So do I have any questions about that? Okay, well, I guess that's a good thing uh, that I don't have any questions. Maybe that means I did an okay job or maybe it's not a good thing because mm, you haven't really paid attention to the project at this point. So what I always tell students is if you're working between now and Saturday on finding an article and you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay, I'll be happy to answer your questions. All right. So the other thing we have to deal with tonight is um, the topic momentum. Okay, so this actually turns out to be one of the, the topics that students do rather well on it. For whatever reason, it seems a bit simpler than some of the other topics we've covered, um, especially given that we just finished gravitation, which can be a complicated topic to deal with. So uh, we're gonna be learning what is momentum uh, and its counterpart impulse. Those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, you'll see how we can use those two um, in terms of problem solving. Uh, so you'll be calculating momentum and impulse. And then you'll look at uh, the first of the conservation laws that we'll tackle in this course, the law of conservation of momentum. We'll see how that works. And then we'll be utilizing our understanding of momentum and impulse to analyze different types of collisions. And so we'll look at what are the different types of collisions and how does uh, momentum play a role in dealing with them. And then finally, we'll look at a concept that's very closely related to this idea of conservation and that is the momentum impulse theorem. And we'll look at that and how we saw problems dealing with that, uh, with that uh, theorem. So um, while it doesn't look like there are nearly as many objectives as for some of our prior topics, uh, these, these objectives are uh, critical and there's a lot to them. Um, so, you know, at any point while I'm covering the material, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, so I'm gonna cover some background on the, on the topic um, in my supplemental notes, but there's a uh, chapter seven in the textbook that deals with this topic and you can take a look at that material. And I have 
some videos that deal with momentum. And for those of you who, who are a bit more visual, maybe the collision simulator that I've provided a link to here uh, can be helpful. Of course, if you're in lab class, you're gonna actually use that simulator to complete uh, your next experiment. So, um, you know, you'll have a opportunity not only to interact with that simulator, but to use it, you know, for a purpose. So, um, again, I always make this material available to you uh, that relates to the topic right in the required readings viewings. I, for whatever reason, at this late stage in the game, I'm still getting emails from students asking me, where's the book? And I'm thinking at this point, if you don't know that I've been every week sharing a portion of the book with you in the readings and viewings, then what have you been paying attention to all this time, right? So don't forget, you have access to material to help you. In addition, uh, for this topic, I'm going to go to our extra notes and also uh, utilize them to look at uh, several example problems. So, so remember, I always post links to the extra notes when I post the announcements containing the video. So you'll be able to get to these extra resources there. And of course, you know, under useful links right there on the left menu, you have access to other resources that you might utilize to help you with this material. Okay. And so um, you have some activities that are due by Saturday. So not only do you have your project articles to get approved, uh, you still have your regular assignments to complete this weekend. So you've got problem set number eight that's due Saturday. Uh, remember, problem sets always lag a week behind. So this problem set eight actually deals with gravitation from last week. So now that you've had a chance to read and digest that material and do a discussion on it, uh, you have a problem set to complete on it. And then um, you have a discussion uh, that deals with momentum, the topic for this week that you will complete by Saturday. And remember when you or completing this, uh, any discussion, you have to post your answers to the discussion and you have to respond thoroughly and in detail to your class, two of your classmates, all right? And then you have your next bonus, which I'll talk about here in just a few moments. Uh, you, you have an opportunity for a second bonus. And so, um, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment, all right? So as a reminder, there are instructions on how you submit your problem set. Of course, you know by now, discussions get completed in the discussion forum. You do not email me your discussion responses unless directed to do so. And then there's a link to the class questions forum in the event you need to ask me a question about anything you're working on. So let me go into the second bonus. Let me stop the share for just a moment. I meant to do this. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn my camera on. So this second bonus deals with Newton's laws. Um, and so what you're gonna do for this bonus is you're gonna build what I like to call my, my uh, Newton car and you're gonna have um, your Newton jet car challenge, okay? And so this bonus, if you choose to complete it, uh, requires that you uh, build a car using the materials listed, okay? Um, and then you also have to complete a write-up that explains how each of Newton's laws applies to the motion of the car. Uh, I guess I need to be specific here and say to you directly that once you've built the car, you need to send me at least a picture of your car or a video of your car so that I know you actually did that, okay? But, um, if you don't include both items, the car, 
and your write-up when you submit it to me, then you won't be eligible for the bonus points. And this is worth 10 bonus points that you can use as you, you know, as you need. Uh, meaning you can take those 10 bonus points and you can add them to any assignment except the project and your overall course score. So for example, you could say, hey, I wanna take my 10 points and put it toward my midterm score. I'll go back and add the 10 points to your midterm score. Or you could say, I wanna take my 10 points and use it uh, for problem set number, whichever one you pick. Uh, or you could say, I wanna put five points on problem set, on a problem set and the other five points I wanna save toward the final exam. Or you could say, hey, I wanna save the whole 10 points and put it on my final exam. However you choose to use those 10 points, you can do so, except you cannot add it to the project score or you cannot add it to your overall course score, right? So um, sometimes I get questions about the materials. So the four plastic lids are like drink cup lids or something similar to that. Uh, the skewers, uh, you should use like um, wood skewers. That's like what you use to make like shish kebab. Um, just be careful with those because skewers have like a pointy tip, you know, and I, I don't want anybody poking themselves and you should not use metal skewers, okay? Um, the tray, a lot of times I get a question about, well, what what is this tray and what, you know, what? What kind of material should I use for this tray? So it could be a styrofoam tray. It could be cardboard. It could be um, aluminum foil, uh, any of those types of material. And like with anything else, if you have questions about, you know, a material or its acceptability, just email me and ask me. I'll be happy to, uh, I'll be happy to respond to you. All right, um, so let me just, you know, give you a moment to ask any questions you might have about this second bonus. Just feel free to unmute and ask your question. Okay, no, well, looks like that's, uh, Pretty, um, I guess if you know if you don't have any questions, I guess I, I've done a pretty decent job of explaining. But <clears throat> again, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions. And and again, don't forget that you have to send me some type of picture or video so that I know you actually built the car. All right. So that's your second bonus. That's due this Saturday. All right. So let's jump right into the momentum material. So I'll go to my supplemental notes here. Okay, so there are the unit objectives that are dealt with in this packet. So <clears throat> the first thing I wanna do is uh, define linear momentum. A lot of times you just hear it referred to as momentum. We don't designate linear or not at this point because um, we don't deal with the other type, momentum, type of momentum that uh, you know, many times is covered in a physics course. There are actually two types of momentum, linear and angular, but since we only cover linear, a lot of times you'll hear it referred to as just momentum, okay? So linear momentum is the product of mass times velocity, okay? So, um, 
When you take the mass of an object, multiply it by that object's velocity, you are calculating the momentum. We use the lowercase p, lowercase p to uh, symbol it, you know, that's the symbol for linear momentum. And a very important concept is that uh, this momentum is a vector. Okay. So, you know, all of the vector rules that you learned way back in chapter four, I mean, in, uh, you know, in our um, problem set four, that's what I meant, problem set four, uh, all of the vector rules that you learned about that they're relevant when dealing with momentum, okay? And so remember, direction is important. Remember, mass is a scalar and it doesn't have direction, but velocity is a vector. And so direction um, is, is important when you're calculating momentum because the velocity gives momentum a direction and makes it a vector, okay? So for example, you could have two objects, same mass, same speed, because remember speed is not the same thing as velocity. So same mass, same speed, moving in opposite directions and their momentum is not going to be the same because direction matters, okay? There's a real close connection between momentum and Newton's second law. If you remember Newton's second law, it says force equals mass times acceleration, okay? And so, well, let me be, um, a little bit more specific, because really when we use Newton's second law, it's not just force equals mass times acceleration. It is actually net force equals mass times acceleration. So if Newton's second law says net force equals mass times acceleration, and we express that relationship in terms of momentum, what it becomes is F net equals change in momentum divided by change in time. So that, that means there are two ways that we can express Newton's second law. F net equals mass times acceleration or F net equals change in momentum over change in time. And I could uh, show you mathematically how that works out. So let's take a look at that. That's worth uh, having um, a moment to, to look at. So I'll open up a, a whiteboard. Let me try to zoom in a little bit. Seems like it. Okay. So, man, I gotta move that out the way. All right, so if we remember Newton's second law says F net equals to mass times acceleration. But then we have to go in and substitute, what is acceleration? Acceleration is delta V over delta T. And then if you remember your math rules about multiplying by a constant, a, a constant value, then we know we can also rewrite this as delta 
uh, M times V. Okay, because mass is constant. So, because we don't deal with systems where the mass changes. I think I mentioned to you that mentioned that to you before. So mass is constant. So we can bring the mass on the inside of the parentheses, right? But now remember, what is, del what is M times V? M times V, mass times velocity is momentum. So that becomes delta P over delta T. So there, you see right from Newton's second law, we can, we can express the net force in terms of the change in momentum, okay? So that's a, that's a pretty important connection to make that, you know, right out of Newton's second law comes the, change in momentum over change in time, okay? So alternate way of looking at Newton's second law, All right? So now let me go back into, back into the notes here. So I showed you how you get that relationship. I, I don't expect that you would derive that on your own, I don't expect you to do that math, but I wanted you to see that you can use Newton's second law and, and um, derive the relationship net force equals change in momentum over change in time, okay? And so, um, you know, if we're using momentum as a way of writing Newton's second law, we have to remember our units. So the unit for momentum, since it's mass times velocity, is kilogram meters per second. Kilogram meters per second. So here's a new property, momentum. And the unit for momentum is mass times, the, the value for momentum is mass times velocity. And so you have units, kilogram meters per second. So um, there's another property that's very closely related to momentum and that's impulse, impulse. And you see what they did to get impulse, they took the formula for F net and they multiply both sides by delta T. So let's see how we, how we do that, okay? So if we take this formula right here, this F net formula, and I multiply both sides by delta T, I get delta T times F net To see what I'm doing is I'm multiplying the left side times delta T. And then when I multiply the right side times delta T, this delta T gets canceled. And so that becomes equal to delta P. So this relationship is known as the impulse momentum theorem. This relationship right here called the impulse momentum theorem. All right, so that, that shows you how you can get the impulse momentum theorem. 
by multiplying both sides by delta T. All right. And one thing that you have to be careful about that students often make a mistake with is that they think that momentum is the key property when you're dealing with impulse. Be careful because what it's actually saying is that change in momentum is equal to impulse. Momentum is not equal to impulse. Change in momentum is equal to impulse, okay? And so, um, as I said, this, this comes out of, you know, some, some algebra and rearranging Newton's second law. And what it tells us is that um, we can figure out how an object's momentum is going to change if we look at the force that's being applied to that object times the time interval over which it acts. So F net times the time interval delta T is what tells you how much an object's momentum is going to change, okay? And so when we look at this, remember, impulse involves two things, the net force and the time interval. And so you can get an impulse by having a large force over a small time interval or a small force acting over a much longer time interval, okay? So two scenarios, so an example of that, uh, that idea of impulse is, for example, like uh, baseball, um, you know, baseball season is going on right now and or yeah, yeah, I think the, the pros are playing baseball right now. And so a lot of times in baseball, you have two different types of, of hits. One of them is like a home run hit and the other one is like a bunt hit. And so with the home run hit, what you wanna do is have a good follow through and a longer time interval. So a longer time interval, meaning what? At, when the batter, swings and makes contact with the ball, they want to follow through and throughout their swing, they want the bat to stay in contact with the ball. Why? Because then you have a longer time interval and therefore a larger momentum change, a larger impulse. Uh, compared to a bunt hit, you know, that's that short hit that doesn't go very far. And so, because the bat doesn't stay in contact very long, you have a small time interval, then you have a much smaller, um, you, you have a smaller impulse, right? And so, um, you know, that, that whole idea of change in momentum is what becomes relevant in those two scenarios. And so that's what they're trying to, um, they're trying to give you an example here. They talk about a racket, racket hitting uh, a tennis ball, that, that same concept, right? Base, a bat hitting a baseball, racket ball hitting a tennis ball, a golf club hitting a golf ball. All of those involve um, applying a force over a time interval. And what they're trying to impart here by talking about the constant effective force is pretty much the idea that you know, think about it, um, a, a batter who, who swings, a lot of times um, the, the maximum force that they can generate is pretty steady, right? Um, or, or, you know, they, they can't swing much, you know, a whole lot less than that actual force or a whole lot more than that actual force. And if you look at it over, um, you know, averaged out, you get what they call that effective force, okay? And so, um, not that I would ever have you calculate that average effective force, but it's just conceptual to understand that, you know, whenever a, a tennis pro hits the tennis ball, they're not gonna hit with the same amount of force every time. But if you look at over at, you know, over multiple swings, 
the average force that they you gonna swing with is gonna be fairly the same, yeah, pretty much the same. Okay. And now um, another important concept that we talk about when we deal with momentum is the conservation of momentum. Okay. And, and that's why momentum is such a valuable uh, property because it is one of those properties that can be con that, that's conserved, uh, meaning that um, the momentum um, remains the same within a, a system that's isolated. So you can, you can kind of think of, you know, we have this magical capability of taking objects and, and um, putting them in this bubble where they're not being impacted by outside forces. And so in a scenario where the net external force, if net is zero, momentum is conserved. And we can see that very clearly here from our formula, right? If F net, think about in this formula here, the one I have in the box, if F net is zero, then it means what? Delta P is zero. So if F net, if F net is equal to zero, oh, that's, that's not nice. Let me see, let me move this out the way. Okay, if F net is zero, that means what? Then delta P has to be zero. So that means what? If delta P is zero, the initial momentum, so P, remember we're using the symbol P, P initial is gonna equal to P final. Okay, so this idea of uh, the momentum not changing in this system or the, the starting momentum equaling the final momentum, that is the conservation of momentum. So you see all of that comes right out of Newton's second law. That's why uh, the idea, uh, you know, in this course is that it's, it's, uh, this is a, Newtonian mechanics course, right? Because we rely heavily on Newton's laws, in particular Newton's second law. And so um, anytime we can isolate our system, and meaning the net force is zero, then momentum is going to be conserved, okay? So the total momentum in our system remains fixed. So whatever momentum you start with in your system, is the momentum that you finish with in your system. So we can write initial momentum equals final momentum or the total momentum is constant. Those all mean the same thing, okay? And notice what they're talking about here. They're not talking about a single object here. Notice they say what? For an isolated system of objects. So we've transitioned from looking at individual objects to dealing with a system of objects that are moving. And those objects might be moving around, but when we isolate them from external forces, we can look at the total momentum in that system and it's going to remain constant, okay? And so they give this idea of collisions here. Uh, they talk about the idea of collisions we're not necessarily interested in microscopic collisions because we don't deal with things like protons and electrons. We don't deal with things like subatomic particles, but the idea of conservation momentum is uh, relevant uh, in those types of collisions, but even for um, objects that are much larger than subatomic particles, if we can model that system as being isolated, you know, simplify the system, then we can look at momentum being conserved. So the question then becomes, well, what types of collisions are there? Okay. So we can use momentum conservation to help us analyze collisions. 
And you know, for a collision to happen, you have to have more than one object. Okay, now objects bumping into each other, right? That's a simple enough def definition of what a collision is. <clears throat> and then we can even go into that further by saying, well, what types of collisions are there? Well, one type is an elastic collision. And in an elastic collision, you have momentum being conserved, kinetic energy being conserved. And we'll be talking about kinetic energy next week. But whatever it is, is conserved. And another important thing about an elastic collision is that those objects rebound off of each other. So when we're dealing with an elastic collision, momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is conserved, and the objects bounce off of each other. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about this idea uh, of, you know, internal kinetic energy, we look at the kinetic energy within our system. So we take the uh, kinetic energy of each object, add it up, and the total is always the same. Same thing for momentum. When we take the momentum of each object in our system, remember there's more than one object and these objects are colliding with each other. When we take the momentum of each object, add it up, we always get the same total, okay? And, and while they give this from a perspective of microscopic uh, collisions, we can uh, look at this from the perspective of much larger objects. My favorite example of uh, collisions, of elastic collisions is like though the, the collisions that happen between uh, billiard balls or on a pool table, right? So, you know, you have all of these balls striking each other. And yet when you take the momentum of each object in the system and add it up, you get the same uh, total momentum each time. And, um, you know, those, those balls on a pool table, when they strike each other, they bounce off of each other. And so that's, a, you know, we are imagining that we can isolate the objects, the, the, the pool balls from the outside environment. And so uh, the, in that scenario, momentum will be conserved. And so um, they do give another example here in the notes of elastic collision. And they talk about steel blocks on ice. So uh, because we can reduce, we, we can imagine that these blocks are colliding with each other on, on the ice, um, the ice is helping to minimize the friction. And so we can model that as uh, an environment where outside forces aren't relevant. And so momentum is being conserved, kinetic energy is being conserved and the objects are hitting each other and rebounding. And so they give you a picture here. Imagine these steel blocks um, and they do it with, with just two objects here, M1 and M2. And you look at the system being isolated. That's what the, the, the oval shape uh, indicates, right? There are no outside forces um, intervening and the ice makes this frictionless so you don't have to worry about energy loss. Um, and since it's isolated, the net force is equal to zero. Remember net force means what? When you add up all the different forces acting on this isolated system, they cancel out. Okay. And so now take the momentum of each object add it together and you get to a momentum total. And then if you look at the system after the collision, so before the collision, after the collision, when you add up the momentum of each one after the collision, you get the same total, okay? Same thing for the kinetic energy. The total kinetic energy before the collision is equal to the total kinetic energy after the collision, okay? Momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is conserved, 
And you can see clearly from the picture, the change in direction for each object, the arrows are pointing in different directions, the green arrows. So, um, you know, the objects change their momentum, but uh, the total momentum is staying constant, okay? Another example of a system where momentum is conserved is inelastic collisions, okay? Inelastic collisions. And in particular, we're interested with, we're interested in perfectly inelastic collisions because for our purposes, uh, that is much easier to manage mathematically. Um, and so in these perfectly inelastic collisions, Momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved, okay? So when we look at the kinetic energy of our system, the amount that we start with is not going to be the amount that we finish with, but our momentum is still going to be conserved. The other important feature of an, a perfectly inelastic collision is that those objects stick together after the collision. So you see, that's how they're different, right? Uh, a perfectly elastic collision, the objects rebound off of each other. A perfectly inelastic collision, the objects stick together after the collision. And momentum is conserved for either type of collision, but kinetic energy is not conserved in our perfectly inelastic collision. And so here's our system again, these two steel blocks. Notice before, you know, because it's isolated, the net force is zero. Uh, each object has its own momentum before the collision. The total uh, in this particular scenario is zero, okay? And notice that after the collision, the two objects are stuck together, but the total momentum is still zero, okay? And so um, we can actually analyze this type of inelastic collision. We can do that because after the collision, they're stuck together. And so if they're stuck together, we have to add their masses together. Right Before the collision, we have two separate objects, but after the collision, we have the combination of those two objects. So we add their mass together. And after the collision, if they're stuck together, they must have the same final velocity. Two objects click together will move with the same velocity. Uh, whoever that is, please mute yourself. Okay. So um, because of how the objects behave in this perfectly inelastic collision, we can actually analyze their motion. And we'll see that here shortly when I go in to look at some sample, some example problems, okay? Um, and so uh, because of systems, the systems that we deal with where the mass is constant, we don't get into reaction type systems uh, because our mass is constant. But when you deal with systems where the mass can change, remember we said that in our systems, the mass is gonna always remain the same. But if we expand our use of momentum and look at systems where the mass can change, then we start to get into the rocket problem. Because when you have a reaction type system like a, a rocket, it is constantly using uh, losing fuel, right? Which affects um, the acceleration of the system. And so uh, we can actually use the idea of a changing mass to investigate that motion. Now, we do not have to deal with this type of system in this course. But you know, 
we always say that, you know, it's rocket science. Well, when you get to dealing with momentum um, and changes in momentum, you can begin looking at, you know, um, the rocket problem and hence it then becomes rocket science, right? So momentum is the, the start of understanding this type of system. And that's what they're showing you here, rocket propulsion. Rocket propulsion is based on this changing momentum because the mass is changing. Okay. So um, what I wanna do now is I wanna go to our extra notes. So I'm gonna go over into the announcements, because that's the easiest way to get to our extra notes. And in fact, uh, here's our extra notes folder. And notice there's one there for momentum. So when I post the announcement with today's video, I will post a link to these momentum notes for you. And so what I want to do is take a look at uh, some of these items. Um, in this extra notes folder as a way of looking at some examples, okay? Okay, so what I did in this screenshot here, I know it's kind of small, um, but in this screenshot, I talk about momentum and then I talk about the various types of collisions, okay? Elastic versus inelastic. And so that's a good uh, tool to help you, uh, you know, understand the difference. Uh, in this screenshot, what I did was I uh, made available to you information on, oh, sorry, let me, let me do that. That's a, that uh, takes a look at uh, how we can get the impulse momentum relationship, okay? And so you have access to these items in this extra notes folder. In this particular folder, um, we look at, there are some examples of using momentum and, and uh, uh, excuse me, there are some examples of solving problems that relate to momentum. And there's some examples of solving problems that deal with the conservation momentum. So we'll take a look at this packet um, here, uh, you know, and, and get into those examples. So here's the definition of momentum written out for you, uh, utilizing the problem solving pyramid. Remember the goal here is to simplify the math so you only have to multiply or divide, okay? So momentum P is equal to mass times velocity. And if you uh, utilize the pyramid, you can see um, the relationship between the variables. Uh, the unit for momentum is kilogram meters per second, where the mass is measured in kilograms and the velocity is measured in meters per second. And so here's an example that uses that momentum formula. So find the momentum of a bumper car if it has a total mass of 280 kilograms and a velocity of 3.2 meters per second. So this is pretty straightforward, right? You wanna find the momentum, you know the mass and the velocity. So according to our pyramid, all we have to do is multiply. And we know to ma multiply mass times velocity because they're right next to each other. So 280 kilograms times 3.2 meters per second, that gives us 896 kilogram meters per second. Please be very careful with the units for momentum the unit for momentum is kilogram meters per second, not kilogram meters per second squared. Kilogram meters per second squared is force because that's equivalent to a Newton. But the unit for momentum is kilogram meters per second, okay? So be careful when you're solving to, to deal with the units correctly. So let's take a look at another example. The momentum of a second bumper car is 675 kilogram meters per second. What is its velocity? Its total mass is 300 kilograms. So this time they gave us the momentum in our system. 
I mean, excuse me, the momentum of our bumper car and the mass. And so what we have to do is use our pyramid to figure out the velocity, okay? So that tells us according to our pyramid, we have to take the momentum and divide by the mass. And I know that because momentum is on the top and mass is on the bottom. So 675 kilogram meters per second divided by 300 kilograms, um, the number part becomes 2.25, the kilograms cancel and you're left with meters per second, okay? All right, so those are two examples, two simple and straightforward examples of utilizing the momentum formula. The other scenario that we wanna deal with is the idea of conservation of momentum. And so uh, that's how we get the idea, you know, um, the, the momentum before equals the momentum after because uh, we're dealing with an isolated system. And so the total momentum is the same, okay? The total momentum is the same. The momentum of each object in our system can change, but we always get the same total, okay? So let's take a look. And as I said, this conservation of momentum is relevant when we wanna analyze collisions. When objects are colliding with each other, we, we can use the conservation of momentum to help us analyze that motion, okay? And the two types of collisions are elastic and inelastic. So for elastic, momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is conserved, and the objects are gonna bounce off of each other like what's gonna happen in that picture when that big truck hits that small, tiny car, they're gonna bounce off of each other. And so the truck will lose some momentum, but the car will gain some momentum, but the total will always be the same, okay? Um, in our inelastic collision, that's the other type, kinetic energy is not conserved. And so the momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is not conserved, and the collisions are going to stick together after the collision. So that's what they're depicting there in the picture. You have like a railroad car, and what's going to happen is that the locomotive will come along and, and stick to the, um, the flat car, and those two objects will move off together, okay? And so uh, that's an, a scenario where we can model this idea of an inelastic collision, okay? So let's take a look at some examples that deal with the conservation of momentum. So in this example, you have a five kilogram part traveling at 4.2 meters per second, and it strikes a stationary two kilogram cart and they connect, okay? And we wanna know how fast is this two cart combination, the combination of cart one and two, how fast is it gonna move after the collision, okay? So we wanna know the speed of these two objects after the collision. Well, what we do is, to utilize the conservation of momentum, we look, we take a snapshot before the collision, after the collision, okay? Before the collision, we have cart one, five kilograms times 4.2 meters per second. So it has a total, it has a momentum of 21 kilogram meters per second. Our second cart is not moving. It says what, it was stationary. And so its momentum is zero, right? Because if an object is not moving, it doesn't have any velocity, then it doesn't have any momentum. So what's the total in your system before the collision? 21 kilogram meters per second. Well, we know from the law of conservation of momentum that that means the total momentum after the collision also has to be 21 kilogram meters per second. The other thing about this system is that afterwards, the, the carts are combined. So when you add up the mass of carts one and two, you get a mass of seven kilograms. And then we can utilize that information to help us figure out how fast this you know, combined system will move after the collision. Well, we know the momentum after the collision. We know the mass after the collision. So we simply divide. 
21 kilogram meters per second divided by seven kilograms. That gives you a, a velocity or speed after the collision, three meters per second, okay? So notice how we utilize momentum conservation to solve that problem. If you don't utilize momentum conservation here, you won't be able to address this question. And here's another example of conservation momentum. I like this example because it gets, it reminds you of the fact that momentum is a vector, okay? So you have a 50 kilogram clown shot out of a 250 kilogram cannon at a speed of 20 meters per second. And they ask the question, what, what is the recoil speed of the cannon? Well, let's take each object before, and then let's look at the objects after, right? So before the cannon is fired, nothing's moving. The clown and the cannon are both stationary. So the total momentum in your system is zero. That means the total momentum in your system after the cannon is fired has to also be zero. Why? Because momentum is conserved. The total before has to equal the total after. Well, we know that after the cannon is fired, the clown has a speed of 20 meters per second. And we can take that to mean the clown is moving forward. Because this is, you know, remember when we talk about a velocity, there's direction involved. So the clown is shot out of the cannon and we can imagine, envision the clown moving forward, okay? So we multiply 50 kilograms times 20 meters per second. And that means after the cannon is fired, the clown has a momentum of a thousand kilogram meters per second. Well, if the clown has a positive 1,000 kilogram meters per second and our total has to be zero, then that means the cannon has to have a negative 1,000 kilogram meters per second. Why? Because positive 1,000 plus negative 1,000 is the only way we can get a total of zero. And since momentum is conserved, the total after has to be zero, okay? So notice how we use momentum conservation to help us know what the momentum of the cannon would have to be after the cannon is fired. And so now we can solve for velocity. So we take negative 1000 kilogram meters per second divided by 250 kilograms. And that gives us negative four meters per second, meaning what? The speed of the cannon is four meters per second and since it recoils, it has to recoil backwards, which means that's negative, right? If positive 1,000 kilogram meters per second means the clown is going forward, then negative 1,000 kilogram meters per second means the cannon recoils backwards, okay? So notice how we use conservation of momentum to help us solve that problem, okay? And these are some typical examples of what you will have to do in problem set number nine that'll be on your plate next week, right? Um, problem set number nine actually requires that you use a momentum and momentum conservation to solve problems, all right? So in this next packet, remember all of these items are available in the extra notes folder, right? Right in the extra notes folder, you find this item, okay? In this packet, it gives a recap of momentum, but it also focuses on impulse, okay? So here's an alternate take on momentum. You know, momentum tells us the quantity of motion, how much motion an object possesses, right? And we find how much motion an object possesses by multiplying mass times velocity. But momentum also tells us how difficult it is going to be to stop that moving object. Because if the object has more motion, it's gonna be more difficult to stop it, okay? And so remember, oh, sorry about that. Let me go back to that, okay? Remember that momentum is a vector quantity. 
Okay. Oh, I'm trying to, uh, let's see. Okay, momentum is a vector quantity because velocity is a vector quantity. Uh, the unit is kilogram meters per second. And, you know, since momentum tells us the amount of motion or how difficult it is to stop a moving object, if an object has a, um, a large mass or a large velocity or both, then it can have a, a large momentum or a high momentum value, okay? And so, um, you know, it's important that you remember when you are dealing with momentum, you are dealing with mass and velocity. And so uh, if the velocity of our objects is equal, then whichever one has the largest mass is going to have the largest momentum. Likewise, if the objects have the same mass, then the object with the largest velocity is going to have the larger momentum. But typically what we have to do when we deal with momentum is look at the mass, the combination of mass and velocity, right? So you could have a small object like a bullet moving very fast and it will have a high momentum or you could have um, you know, a charging elephant with a large mass and a smaller velocity still having a very large momentum. Either of those objects is gonna be very difficult to stop, okay? And then we can get into the property impulse. And so remember that to change an object's momentum, you need to apply a force over a time interval, right? To change an object's momentum, delta P requires that you apply a force over a, a time interval. And it is this delta P or this force times change in time that is impulse. And so we can, we can uh, break that equation uh, down. We can break the, the delta P into its um, you know, starting and final, uh, starting momentum value and final momentum value. And so when we write uh, delta P as mass times velocity final minus mass times velocity initial, we call that the impulse momentum theorem, okay? And so now let's, let's take a look at this idea of impulse. So imagine that this um, object is a ball and the ball is pitched and it hits the wall. When it hits the wall, the wall is going to exert an impulse on it. Well, remember your Newton's third law. If the ball exerts a force on the wall, the wall exert, exerts a force back, right? And so the force times the time interval that the wall exerts is the impulse. And that impulse is going to cause the ball to change its momentum. And so here's a sample problem that utilizes the impulse momentum theorem. A 1400 kilogram car moving westward, pay attention to that direction now, westward with a velocity of 15 meters per second collides with the pole and is brought to rest in 0 0.30 seconds. What is the magnitude of the force exerted on the car during the collision? So you have, in, have this car moving west. And remember, that's your direction involved. And we, we stated early on when dealing with vectors, what? East is positive, west is negative, right? Because uh, we have the way of, design, have, have it, we use that as a way of designating direction, okay? But the other important thing about this is that this collision takes place in a very short time span, 0.3 zero seconds. That's less than half a second. In less than half a second, this 1400 kilogram car is going to be, um, you know, is going to come to a stop in that short time span. And it is because of this short time span that the force in, in involved in this collision is going to be very high. Remember, when we're dealing with impulse, you can have what? A small time interval and a force that spikes, right? Or you can have a long time and longer time interval with, with a force that's less. 
and we'll see both of those things play out here, okay? So let's see how much force. So to figure out the amount of force, we go to our impulse momentum theorem, all right? They gave us the time interval, 0 0.30 seconds. They told us the mass of the car, which doesn't change, 1,400 kilograms before it hits the pole and 1,400 kilograms after it hits the pole. But we do know that the velocity is what changes because after the collision, the car comes to a stop. So afterwards, V final is zero. Before the collision, the car was moving with 15 meters per second westward. So that's why there's a negative sign there because velocity has to have a direction. So that negative 15 meters per second doesn't tell us greater than, less than, it tells us direction because velocity is a vector, all right? So now you see the first term on the right side is gonna drop out because 1400 times zero, that goes away. But negative four, the, the minus sign uh, that's part of the formula is multiplied times the minus sign that's part of the velocity and you know, negative times negative gives positive. So 1400 times 15 gives me 21,000. 21,000 kilogram meters per second. But I'm not done yet because they asked me for F. They asked me to find the force involved here. So I have to divide both sides by 0 0.30 seconds. So 21,000 kilogram meters per second divided by 0 0.30 seconds gives me 70,000 or seven times 10 to the four newtons of force. And I know that it's pointing to the east because west is negative. Anything positive must be pointing to the east. So when this car that's moving westward hits this pole, the pole exerts a force on it eastward in the amount of 70,000 or seven times 10 to the four newtons. That's an extreme amount of force. Okay, a very high force generated in a very short time span. That's what makes collision so deadly. There's so much force over a short time span. So the question becomes, how can I minimize the effect of this collision to whoever's you know, in the vehicle? Well, number one, we studied Newton's first law. We know that one of the things we need to do is we need to have on a seatbelt. Why? Because a seatbelt provides what? The unless, right? It says what? Newton's first law? The object is going to keep moving with the same velocity unless acted upon by a net force. So if that seatbelt is going to provide the unless, okay, um, that allows you to have, um, you know, a way of changing that object's um, velocity, right? Slowing the occupant of the vehicle down so that they don't get ejected. But that's not the whole thing that needs to happen here to ensure the safety of the occupant. The other important thing is an airbag. The airbag allows the occupant to have more time to come to a stop. And so um, the car is going to come to a stop in 0 0.30 seconds, but the airbag is going to allow the person inside the vehicle to take longer to come to a stop and therefore experience a much smaller force. So let's just say, for example, that we could make the collision last a half a second. So instead of 0 0.30 seconds, let's give 0 0.50 seconds, okay? If we increase the collision time to 0 0.50 seconds or half a second, now when we divide 21,000 kilogram meters per second by 0 0.5, we get a total force of what? 42,000 newtons, right? And so by increasing the collision time, the delta T, the time span, the time interval, the duration of this collision, 
by two tenths of a second, we've dropped the force almost in half. And so that's why airbags are so important because airbags combined with the seat belt will number one, help to keep you from flying out of the vehicle, which, you know, if you fly out, if you get ejected from, from a vehicle going, uh, you know, experiencing that much force, when you hit the ground or you hit whatever, it's, it, you're almost gonna be a guaranteed to have, you know, die instantaneously, right? So the seatbelt is vital. But even if you don't get ejected, you know, the, the collision happening that fast can also be very detrimental to internal organs and those types of things, right? So by providing an airbag, um, we allow the collision to, to, to last a little bit longer, therefore drop the force that the occupant experiences. Now, I know that there are a lot of arguments people make for, you know, uh, People will have airbags on, you know, they die in a collision because they suffocate and all of those kinds of things. But the combination of, of seat belts and airbags have saved a great many more lives than they've taken in collisions. So, um, you know, I always tell students this, this, this block of instruction on momentum and impulse uh, can save your life because it tells you, you know, how do you, it tells you the value and the importance of those uh, safety devices in your vehicle, okay? So, um, you know, there you have some examples of momentum, momentum conservation, and uh, impulse, the impulse momentum theorem. So you know, in this extra notes folder, I would advise you to, you know, really take a look at that because there's some really good examples and because you're going to see these types of examples on problem set number nine, this information is really valuable to you, okay? So um, I'm gonna stop sharing now and uh, give you the opportunity to unmute and ask any questions that you might have. Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions for me, uh, that is what I have for you tonight. Uh, please stay tuned uh, sometime tonight or maybe in the wee hours of the morning. I'll have your, uh, your midterm exams uh, scored. I do apologize for the delay, um, but I'll get that done for you to, by tonight. And um, if you have any questions beyond that on this material or your exam or anything at the project uh, article, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll be more than willing to address your questions. You can email me, come during office hours, um, you know, whatever it takes to get your question answered. Uh, with that, I'll say uh, everybody have a good night. We're all done. So I'm going to stop recording.